back when I was staying with the John Fuang, it was very rare that we had other Western monks coming to the monastery. One time one came. He'd been to practically every meditation center, every meditation monastery in the country. He said he was looking for a quiet place. So he took him way up the hill. We had a hut. It was up in the forest. Next day he came down and said, no, still not quiet enough. So I went up to find out for myself. And way off in the distance there was a little water pump in one of the orchards, but it was very faint. And it struck me that that monk would never find a place that was totally quiet. And of course, the problem wasn't with the sounds out there at all. It was his mind's fascination with the sounds, his commentary on the sounds. Or in John Cha's phrase, it's not that the sounds are disturbing us, the, we're disturbing the sounds. And that point applies to our thoughts as well. What we're practicing here is something the Buddha calls anupasana. It's in the description for right mindfulness. Anu means to follow. Pasana means to watch or to see. Basically, you're keeping track of something, but you're keeping track of it in the midst of other things. After all, there are physical sensations going on right now, there are thoughts going on right now, there are feelings. And you want to pay most attention to the breath in the midst of all that. And as for anything else that comes up, put it aside. The problem is that many of us think that when we're getting the mind into concentration, there shouldn't be any other thoughts, anything else aside from that one object. And in the very high levels of concentration, that does happen. But as you're getting started out, you're bound to have other thoughts coming up in the mind. It's simply a matter of learning how not to pay them any attention. Our problem is that we're too interested in our own thoughts. It's almost like as a thought begins to form in the mind, we think it's like a little present. We want to see what's in the thought. We open it up, and sometimes there's something entertaining there, sometimes there's something interesting, something practical. Sometimes the little box of the present is like Pandora's box. You open it up and you get swept away. And one of the important lessons of practicing anupasana is to see your thoughts as not interesting. There's nothing there right now. And you have to learn how to make the breath more interesting. Remind yourself that the breath does have an effect on the body. The way the breath energy flows in the body is going to have an effect on your health. And it's going to have an effect on how your mind is willing or not willing to settle down in the present moment. So there's a lot to study in the breath. There's long breathing, the short breathing, in, long, out, short, in, short, out, long. Heavy, light, fast, slow, deep, shallow. And all kinds of variations on those various different ways of looking at the breath or working with the breath. And so you want to see what your body needs right now. Now sometimes the anupasana that you're following will switch from the breath to the feelings. And as long as the feelings are related to the breath, that's okay. And sometimes they'll switch to the mind. Is the mind steadily with the breath, or is it beginning to waver a bit? And again, as long as you're focused on how the mind relates to the breath and what can be done to make it relate in a better way, that's fine as well. You'll be going back and forth among these three things, body, feelings, mind. Those are the three things you're keeping track of. In the hopes that you can bring them into one. In other words, the breath is here and feels good. You have a sense of the breath filling the body, a feeling of ease filling the body, and your awareness filling the body. That's when they become one. But up until that point, you'll be following one or the other, and as long as 
you're following them in terms of how they're related, that's okay. And as for any other thoughts that come up, you don't have to make any comments on them. Just leave them be. Some people get discouraged. They focus on the breath, and all of a sudden other things come up. They think there's something wrong with their meditation, that they'll never get the mind to settle down. It's simply a matter of learning how to focus in the midst of distraction and not get distracted. The Buddha's image is of a man walking through a crowd of people. On the one side there's a beauty queen singing and dancing, on the other side there's a crowd of people excited about the beauty queen singing and dancing. And the man's walking between the two. He's got a bowl full of oil on his head, and behind him there's another man with his sword raised, ready to cut off the head of the first man if as much as even a drop of oil gets spilled. So as the Buddha asks, will that man let his attention get? get distracted by the beauty queen or the crowd? Well, no. It stays focused on that bowl of oil. That doesn't mean that the beauty queen is not there, or he's not even aware of her. There's some awareness, and the same with the crowd. The Buddha doesn't explain the analogy any further. I think the beauty queen stands for sight, sound, smells, taste, tactile sensations. The crowd stands for your mind's comments on these things. I'm sure if, if the man could, he would like to have both of them wiped out, but he can't. They're there. So he just stays focused on that bowl of oil. In the same way, stay focused on the breath. Even though the thoughts may come up in the mind, you don't have to get involved. Sounds may come in from outside, you don't have to get involved. You don't have to make a commentary on them. Think of that image of the one hand clapping. When there's a sight or a sound and you make a comment on it, that's two hands clapping. But if it's just the sound and you don't make a comment on it, that's one hand clapping. Or thoughts come up and you don't clap the thoughts, okay, that's one hand clapping. In other words, you don't have to get involved in these things. But as I said, the main problem is that we find our thoughts too interesting. So just remind yourself that just the brain churning out whatever. It's like a factory that doesn't have any quality control. And the machines in the factory have a lot of momentum. Even after the products are no longer wanted, they keep on churning them out, churning them out. So you just have to tell yourself you're not going to buy them, even though they're churning out. And they seem to be really cheap. You're still not going to buy. So try to follow the thread of your breath through time, or the feelings related to the breath, or your awareness related to the breath. Keep all these things together. And John Lee's images of a, a rope that has three strands. Each strand on its own may be weak, but when you put the three strands together, twist them together, then the rope gets strong. So it's simply a matter of following it through time. And tell yourself, at the moment, nothing else matters. When you get your priorities straight like this, then it's easier for the mind to settle down.